Hello, I'm Ron Strickland. This webcast is one of a series in which I'm providing some brief lectures and commentaries on topics from the courses I teach in literary and cultural studies. Here, I'll say some things about the concept of ideology in the Marxist tradition. And I'll focus especially on the structuralist and psychoanalytic theory inflected concept of ideology developed by Louis Althusser in his landmark essay, Ideology and Ideological State Apparatuses. Ideology was a relatively new term when Marx and Engels used it in the German ideology in the middle of the 1840s. The term ideology had been coined in the 1790s by the French rationalist philosopher Destut de Tracy to distinguish ideology as the science of ideas as opposed to metaphysics. The term very quickly took on a pejorative sense, and Marx and Engels use it that way in the German ideology. There, ideology refers to theory that is out of touch with the material processes of history. The ruling ideas of any epoch, Marx and Engels argue, are nothing more than the ideal expression of the dominant material relationships, the dominant material relationships grasped as ideas. But the relationship between material processes and the ruling ideas of an epoch is perceived in reverse, and Marx and Engels describe this phenomenon in a way that has echoes of their critique of Hegel's idealist conception of history. In a passage from the German ideology, they write, If, in all ideology, men and their circumstances appear upside down, as in a camera obscura, this phenomenon arises just as much from their historical life process as the inversion of objects on their retina does from their physical life process. This negative sense of ideology as false consciousness was the most common usage in Marxist theory until the last part of the 20th century. It was, among other things, a convenient way to account for the reluctance of oppressed workers to rise up in revolt. However, there is another sense of the term in which ideology is not seen as a false consciousness against which a true scientific reality might be opposed, but instead ideology is seen as the fundamental condition of human consciousness. This understanding of ideology as embedded in material signs and as inseparable from material and historical processes can be found in many places in Marx and Engels' writings. But a particularly clear statement of this argument can be seen in Vian Voloshinov's Marxism and Philosophy of Language. He writes, The only possible objective definition of consciousness is a sociological one. Consciousness takes shape and being in the material of signs created by an organized group in the process of social intercourse. The logic of consciousness is the logic of ideological communication, of the semiotic interaction of a social group. If we deprive consciousness of its semiotic, ideological content, it would have absolutely nothing left. Consciousness can harbor only in the image, the word, the meaningful gesture, and so forth. From the 1920s through the 1960s, Marxist theorists like Boloshinov, Mikhail Bakhtin, and Antonio Gramsci had articulated complex, nuanced theories of ideology. But these theorists had not been translated into English until the 1970s, so they were unknown in American literary and cultural studies circles. It was a French philosopher, Louis Althusser, whose rethinking of the concept of ideology in his essay, Ideology and Ideological State Apparatuses, sparked a revival of interest in Marxist theory in British and American literary and cultural scholarship. Influenced by Jacques Lacan's psycholinguistic theory of the mirror stage in the formation of the social subject, Althusser argues that ideology has the primary function of constituting concrete individuals as social subjects. Althusser illustrates this process of ideological interpolation with an example of a person walking down the street. Suddenly a policeman calls out, hey you, and the person turns around in response. That response, which is more or less involuntary, to a hailing which is nonspecific is, Althusser argues, a model of how the individual is called into a subject position. 
One is born, one is assigned a family, a name, a gender, a race, an ethnicity, a nationality, a class status. And most of these assignments are accepted more or less without any conscious choice on the part of the subject. In this way, the individual is hailed or called into a social subject position, made a subject of a particular social formation, in a process which involves little, if any, individual agency. One consequence of this theory is that conventional conceptions of individuality, of the author, of authority, conceptions that have been central to the values of the Enlightenment and modernity, are called into question. Althusser's conception of ideology has been criticized as being a closed box or a prison from which there is no escape. Althusser's notion of the subject, it's argued, offers no possibility of individual resistance or agency. One of the ways that Althusser attempts to address this objection is by distinguishing between ideology in general, which is the ideology that interpolates subjects as I've just described, and ideology in particular. Ideology in general is the common sense framework of understanding and possibilities that determines the limits of what can be thought in a society. Particular ideologies are the values, traditions, and shared understandings of reality common to members of a particular social group. In the disjuncture between particular ideologies or between particular ideologies and ideology in general, there might be some space for a kind of agency, some space for critical distance. Notwithstanding the bleakness of this perspective, I find Althusser's conception of ideology and subjectivity to be quite useful. It's a good strategic framework for ideology critique and for the project of theorizing meaningful resistance and agency. It's a good strategy to err on the side of skepticism in these matters. I'll conclude this webcast by discussing Althusser's theory of the relationship between what he calls the ideological state apparatus and what he calls the repressive state apparatuses. The ideological state apparatus, which we've been discussing to this point, include the family, the church, the educational system, the legal system, media, and so on. The repressive state apparatuses include, of course, the police, the military, and the criminal justice system. Althusser argues that there is a blurry line between these two domains of state control. On the one hand, the effectiveness of ideological state apparatuses in maintaining control of society depends in part upon the foundation of repressive state apparatuses which will be called in in cases of necessity. On the other hand, the repressive state apparatuses cannot function without the ideological state apparatuses. The policeman or the soldier or the prison guard has to be convinced that he is acting in the best interests of the society as he carries out his duties. So there are very complex relationships between the ideological state apparatuses and the repressive state apparatuses. And there are an infinite number of points in the system where there is always a potential for breakdown. This is the key insight of Althusser's theorization of the relationship between the ideological state apparatuses and the repressive state apparatuses. A social formation is vulnerable. The social formation has to maintain its dominance at every moment. The system has to recreate itself, has to reimpose itself constantly in the face of continually evolving new historical circumstances. In the end, it's a messy system, and there is always the possibility for revolutionary change. With that, I'll conclude this webcast. But if you have questions or comments as you're reading about and thinking about this topic, send me an email.